Some of you know that uh, in the month of January, I often travel to Australia to teach interplay, which is this other thing I do in my life. It's an improvisational technique that combines movement and storytelling and singing. I've been going to Australia year after year. I've probably been there between 20 and 25 times now, and it's one of the treats of my year. And what happens is that I'm usually teaching in uh, three cities, doing a weekend workshop, like a Thursday through Saturday, or a Friday through Sunday, uh, and they're kind of all day events. And, uh, great fun and, and wonderful opportunity to be there. And oftentimes, almost always what happens on the middle night uh, is they have a community night. So that evening we gather and we create things on the spot and we invite family and friends to come and visit as well and to just get a little taste of what interplay is like. Um, one of the things that I almost always do in those, um, these kind of informal performances is to do what we call a big body story. Uh, which is a combination of movement and storytelling and sound. It's kind of like one of my sermons on steroids. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I just kind of knew that this year, that as I approached that task, and you know, as I look at that, I, I, we, I am improvising, so I don't know exactly what I'm going to talk about, but I sometimes kind of mull around what might come up, and I knew that at one level or another, that I would want to address the current political state, uh, situation in the United States because that seems to be the thing that is occupying so much space and time and energy in the lives of people in this country and in the lives of people in other countries. You know, of course, that politics, the politics that happen in the United States uh, spread all over the world, whether the rest of the world likes it or not. So it's, not, it's, it's something that they're very aware of, and people would ask me, well, what's, what's it, what is it like? Because mostly interplayers tend to be fairly progressive folks, and so you probably have fairly similar uh, progressive political leanings. And actually, some of the patterns that happen in the United States in our politics happen there as well. But the idea of taking on our president and politics in a single story, in a single night, it seemed like a daunting task, and I didn't know exactly how this might work, how this would come out. But the first, the first weekend, which was uh, a little bit up the coast from Sydney in, in a place called Brunswick Head, um, we were having one of these community nights, and it was my turn to do uh, a, a story in the midst of this community night celebration. And I came out in the middle of things, and you know, you have to know that a big body story is not always um, linear. <laughs> That's an understatement, um, probably. But I found myself coming out to the center of the space, and I just said, eschatology. <laughs> now, like interplay communities in a number of places, there are probably some church folks in that crowd, and they might know what that word means, but they might not. So I went on to explain that eschatology really is kind of the study of the consideration of the end times. And sometimes we feel like it's the end times. And I told them that these days the people in the, seminary, in the seminaries that are teaching about eschatology were just handing out copies of the New York Times. <laughs> and of course they had to do that every day because every day there were new signs importance of the end of, of time. And you know, the end times of the apocalypse, you know, this is something that kind of creeps around the edges of Christian theology, not so much in, with progressive Christians, but you know, it's still there. I heard the word apocalypse on Rachel Maddow's show last Friday night. They were actually talking about what might happen with the Justice Department. <laughs> um, but that word crops up and it has these deep kind of theological roots and so what does it mean to live in a time that can feel like they're all the signs that something major is going on, not just on the small level, but on the big level. So what does it mean to be in the middle of what sometimes feels like chaos? How are we supposed to live in times like that? Now, personally, I don't, I don't really believe in the apocalypse. I mean, I could be proven wrong about this tomorrow. Couldn't we all? 
You know, it's the same kind of thing about kind of contemplating your death. You don't really think it's going to happen tomorrow. But it is going to happen. Now, I'm not sure the apocalypse is going to happen. I just, I don't, I actually don't really know. But the point is, which is, I think, the more important point is, how am I going to live in the face of what feels like systemic chaos or confusion or roiling or whatever it might be? So that's how that story started out. It started out with just this one word. It kind of came out here and said, eschatology. You know, what, what a great beginning. <laughs> but kind of like the beginning of the end, you know? Wasn't it kind of in the Japanese horror movies, Godzilla or Mothra or whatever it was, that at the end, rather than saying the end, would say, it would say, it would either say the end of the beginning or the beginning of the end, you know, something like that. Anyway, so that was one of the parts of the story that came out. But there's this other thing that came out as well, and it was this. Um, you know, my partner, Chin, um, is retired. He's been retired for several years, and I do a lot of my work at home or down, just downstairs in, in my Interplay office, so I'm, we're both around, and he often cooks breakfast, which is such a great thing. He's the cook in the family, and he often makes breakfast. And at some point or another, I don't remember kind of how it happened or when, we got on to waffles. Now, being Vietnamese, waffles isn't exactly part of his cultural heritage. And actually, even though my morning breakfast would almost always be something sweet, and you know, probably not just sweet, but like sweet. Um, but that's not really his practice. But somehow or another, he got on to making waffles. And first, we just had a normal little waffle maker, kind of little flat waffles. But, Chin really likes kitchen gadgets, and it wasn't long before we had a Belgian waffle maker. And, you know, I just want you to draw on all your sense memories of the smell of Belgian waffles and the look of Belgian waffles and how those deep crevices create so much more room for butter and syrup and yogurt and fruit, it's like by the time you've got your plate. You know, lots of people like to photograph their meals you know, on their iPhones. Waffle, the waffles, that's the time when I really want to pull out my iPhone and take a picture of my food. It's with waffles. You know, on election day 2016, we went out early to vote. We came back. We were going to have waffles. You know, I had the yogurt in the middle. I had my blueberries, and I spelled out a little H. <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know that that day might have been the beginning of the end times, but um, I did take a photo of it, um, which may have been the last time I photographed my waffles. But here's, here's the thing that I realized at one point, just fairly recently. This is Chin's superpower, that he can turn any day into a waffle day. It's amazing. Just think about that. The ability to turn any day into waffle day. And so I found myself at the same time in this story in Brunswick Head talking about the ends of times, you know, this apocalypse that could happen any day, and then talking about waffle day. And it was such an interesting juxtaposition because actually one of the things that I found myself saying to people as, as they asked me about what, what it was like in the United States these days, given the political situation, and I said, you know, it's crazy, and it's daily, and it's, it's like a consuming, and we are living our lives with all the simple joys, all the simple pleasures, all the kind of pain and heartbreak and, you know, anything that goes on in life normally is still happening right at that level. It's not like we're spending all of our time with our hair on fire. We spend some of our time with our hair on fire, which I realize is a metaphor for me, is a little bit ironic, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the hair on fire response is like something happens and, ah, it's alarm. But we've also, we're learning that we can't always be in a state of alarm. And we're not, quite frankly, 
You know, we come together and we celebrate as a community every Sunday, just like we've always done. We continue to sing and prayer and pray and listen to scripture and hear words and share our stories and give back and, you know, just like it was a normal day. Not even a waffle day, but just even a, a day that's even more normal than waffle day. So when we think about the end times in um, in the scriptures, we often go to Revelation, but there is also talk about this idea of, of the end times or the change in, in times. And in the scripture this morning, you know, the disciples come to Jesus and they ask him, you know, what, what will be the signs of this? And, you know, we have, um, we have these, this idea of the coming of the realm of God. And whether that's going to be an apocalyptic sort of thing or whether it's something that we're building just kind of constantly, or whether it's something that's more of an afterlife thing or a present life thing. In progressive Christianity, actually we think of, of creating this kingdom of God, not just waiting for it to happen in heaven, but to create it on earth. So what is that thing we pray every, every week? Our creator, heart, and heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So in this little conversation that Jesus is having, ha having with his disciples, there are these threads of, you know, the, the wars and the rumors of wars, a nation turning against nation, which does sound apocalyptic, and yet there's also all these threads kind of in the tradition about the kingdom of God creating the kingdom of God, which is really a, a, a shocking and amazing kind of idea that we might be able to create the kingdom of God here on earth, that it might be more of a day-to-day -day thing than a one-day shocking kind of experience. And a couple of things struck me in this passage. The first one is in verse 8. It, it, it says, all these are the beginnings of birth pains. Birth pains. Well, that's a beginning. That's not an ending. That's the beginning of something. That's the beginning of something new being created. So it's not the end of everything. It's a beginning. So what does it mean to live in these times that we may think are kind of shocking and chaotic and confusing and to see them in the longer term as a move toward the kingdom of God, toward something that might be equally as amazing, but more positive and more hopeful. And then the other thing that really struck me, and I think, you know, this in terms of spiritual practice, this is so important. He, he says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Think about that, the reality of that, that when we are surrounded by wickedness, when that is the thing that's coming toward us all the time, how do we continue to love? And that's such a challenge, isn't it? It's like we want to move toward cynicism, we want to move toward reaction, we want to move toward whatever. It's really hard for us to hold on to love when all around us we're getting messages about challenge and, you know, wickedness. You know, we don't use that word very much anymore, except in kind of an ironic way we, or, or a playful way. It's wicked. But if you think of that, and actually in the version that Kim read, it was long, lawlessness. But to think about how when there is evil or there are things that we see that we think are wrong in the world, how hard it is for us to hold on to love. It is just so easy to slip into cynicism. But I believe that we must continue to stand in love, that this is, where we, this is where we need to make our stand. This is where we need to come right up and we need to stand on our soapbox and we say, love is the most important thing. At this time in life, love is the thing that should be guiding us and it should be an active love. It should, be, it should be fueled by that place in our hearts that feels connected to all things and all people, but we must also move that out into the world. And it may be that love may need to supersede righteousness 
is that we have a long tradition of justice and righteousness that are oftentimes our social action comes out of justice and righteousness. It's like, ugh. And there's often a kind of a punitive side to that. This is right. Something else, someone else is wrong. But when we center ourselves in love, which is, quite frankly, as kind of a preview of what we're going to do during Lent, is it's a foolish, it's a, it's a Christ foolish thing. It's a Christ foolish thing. But yet, I want to call myself to that. I want to call you to that. That we might use that as the central organizing purpose. That love may be the thing we need to put right in the middle of our theology and our sociology and our psychology and our theology. That that is the most important thing. The thing about waffles is that it's not just that having waffles for breakfast can make a day special, at least for me, but that out of his love, Chin makes me waffles. And I just wonder how each of us is making waffles in the world. You know, you could make a waffle any day you want it. And of course, you know now, I'm not, I'm not just talking about the real ones, I'm talking about metaphorical waffles. <laughs> not that I needed to spell that out for you. <laughs> but just think about that, our ability to create ah in the world. That is fueled by love. Amen.